Welcome to Service Meshing with Docker Desktop and WebAssembly. Before we get started, I have an announcement to make. I have an acknowledgement that networking equipment was harmed in the making of this presentation. As such, Kanishkar J, my co-presenter, will not be joining us today. Well, this incident is relevant to our topic at hand. It's uh, rather unfortunate. Well, it's, it's a bit meshed up, really. Well, let's press forward and get started. I'm Lee Calcote. I'm coming to you today from Austin, Texas. I'm also coming to you today over a brand new cable modem. I'm a Docker captain. I focus in the cloud native ecosystem. Uh, much of my time having been spent on service meshes these past uh, couple of years. If you enjoy this talk, uh, want to see the slides or other talks that I've given, visit the URL in yellow and you will have your fill. Kanishkar J, my co-presenter, he's an open source maintainer in the Layer 5 service mesh community. He's been focused on Rust, Wasm, WebAssembly. Um, on, well, management projects that help people adopt service meshes and run them well. So he would love to have your feedback. Go, go join the Slack that's listed here. It's a warm and welcoming community. Uh, be sure to say hi to Kanishkar when you do. So service meshes, what are they? These have been described in a number of different ways. Um, I like to describe them uh, as a service's first network, as a layer of cloud native infrastructure in between, kind of, in be you know, kind of laying down at, at layer five, if you will, in between your orchestrator and your applications. They fulfill some unmet needs that applications have. Um, occasionally, those needs are being met uh, in other places, but service meshes bring together administrative control over some of the some of these needs that are being disparately delivered today. We'll talk about those needs. Um, before we do, I'll say that if you're new to service meshes, there's a great resource here. There's a, a free report from O'Reilly that gives you an introduction to the space, lets you know what a service mesh is and in context of other technologies that you might be familiar with. And so I recommend giving it a read. It's good context uh, to acknowledge that how it is that people get to a service mesh. Really, I consider a service mesh to be the third significant step that people will take in their cloud native journey. A lot of this started about seven years ago with an announcement from Solomon Hikes at PyCon uh, that um, Docker is a project that it's here. About five and a half years ago, really like six years ago now, Docker 1.0 became um, generally available, ready for production use. As people picked up, uh, well, like wildfire, Docker, they found the need for orchestration of all of their containers, all of that sprawl. So about five and a half years ago, um, orchestrators came onto the scene, and they've been production ready for some time. And now, uh, about four years ago, the first service mesh project was announced, and they too have become production ready. Kind of interesting to see the cadence by which the technologies are adopted here. The time of the mesh is upon us, I suppose. We are, many of us have adopted containers and Docker in significant ways. The same goes for the orchestration that we're using to help run those systems. And a number of you have picked up service meshes already, many more of you to come. If we look at uh, service meshes in, in terms of their, the functionality and the features that they provide, there are first a number of different service meshes out there, some of which provide um, all of the things that you see here on the, the slide. Um, and some of them uh, only provide one or two of these things. But to speak to them briefly, these pillars of functionality, um, one of them being about fine-grained traffic control over the packets and the requests that are coming to your services, 
to your workloads. The ability to open those up, look at them, introspect those packets, redirect them, deny them, um, to you know, enforce security, to enforce encryption, to do um, mutual TLS. With that level of control, service meshes are able to um, increase the resiliency of your services, of your distributed systems. I think uh, being something of a network engineer myself, I'd like to think that the network isn't fallible or that it's never the network, it's the application. But uh, that's not true. And so uh, the more resilient you can make your distributed systems, the more resilient you can make your network, the more resilient you can make your distributed systems. Service meshes can uplevel your, uh, the t well, the, uh, your ability to monitor your services, uh, the amount of telemetry that you're getting out of those services. Um, really, in the presence of a service mesh, I think you can expect a lot more from your infrastructure and maybe be lesser concerned with building all of that into your application. We're going to put my demo where my mouth is uh, later and uh, show you this. Service meshes um, are um, like every other technology, not the end all be all. There's uh, much value that, that are promised by them and, and much delivered. Part of that value is to help with modernizing existing applications, existing workloads that you might have. Um, they can help um, uplift your um, existing apps. You can, you can bring those onto the mesh. They aren't, service meshes aren't, um, Con confined to the land of microservices and containers, some service meshes um, allow you to onboard your um, existing applications. So you call those legacy or call those monoliths or maybe just things that are non-containerized. And so they'll, they'll help modernize your, in your infrastructure, modernize your applications, which is um, kind of reminiscent of Docker and part of the value that it provides. So another way of articulating this is to say that you would um, deploy a service mesh to avoid, well, bloating your application code with infrastructure concerns. If today you're writing retry logic into your application code, maybe you shouldn't be. Maybe that's something you don't need to bother with that you could, maybe you can trust your infrastructure to take care of that for you. Trust your service mesh to do it. If you are building in rate limiting logic or circuit breaking or uh, path-based routing or any number of things, you um, can look to your mesh for this. You don't need to put that into code. You can um, define that in YAML, in config, and have your mesh do those things. So you can um, you know, avoid doing duplicative work. You can um, make the behavior of uh, those network services you know, um, the, the retries that I was just talking about, make that consistent across your services, irrespective of what um, language your services are written in, uh, maybe irrespective of some disparate um, infrastructure that you're using. Bring some consistency here. The, another thing that you might use a service mesh to do is to avoid diffusing the responsibility of managing your services Things like uh, defining the number of retries that a given service should make if it fails to make a connection. Um, whose responsibility is that? Is that the developers, the operators, the service owner, the, the product manager? I think a lot of times you find um, some of these questions uh, fall between the cracks that that responsibility is diffused. That's actually um, a significant component of the value of a service mesh that um, really developers, operators, product owners, uh, all of these roles are empowered by the presence of a service mesh. Um, and because of this, because developers don't have to be burdened with as many infrastructure concerns, they can move a bit faster because Operators don't necessarily have to go back to the development teams to ask for some additional telemetry or to enforce a, a rate limit um, or, or change the, the behavior of the circuit breaker. Um, they too are empowered. As a matter of fact, the uh, product owner is empowered, and I won't 
describe how, I will show you in the demo um, how they, are, they too are empowered. So this phenomenon of uh, helping separate and uh, developers and operators um, and letting them iterate a bit independently means that they can move more quickly. And also means that the responsibility of who's defining um, the behavior of these network services is no longer diffused between the teams. So on to the architectures of service mesh. If you're a network engineer, these three components to a service mesh architecture are probably pretty familiar to you. If you've been um, dealing with a container orchestrator, then a few of these terms are probably familiar to you as well. Um, generically speaking, you'll find a couple of networking planes prevalent within any service mesh. You know, it's core to the architecture of any service mesh. One of those is the data plane. This is really where um, the heavy lifting is done. This is um, the, com the grouping and combination of a bunch of network proxies, intelligent, um, intelligent proxies that are brought together to form a data plane. They intercept every request that goes to your services, to your workloads, um, and they provide any number of the, the network services that I was just um, speaking about. Another component uh, to the architecture of a service mesh is the control plane. And this is where uh, you as an operator may interface with your particular service mesh and um, configure it and integrate it with your underlying platform, integrate it with the container orchestrator. This is where you would configure uh, the behavior of a particular type of service mesh. Early on, as service meshes as a term and as a concept were coming into being, um, it was the case that, that there were some that were projects that were announced as a service mesh, but, but really didn't, really only had a data plane and were kind of missing the control plane. So you, you, you need the, the combination of those two to kind of fit into the category of, of, uh, of a project being a service mesh. There's also this, uh, a third plane here, and that is of a management layer, a management plane. Management plane provides, well, any number of things, advanced policy, additional governance, really helps you in interface, uh, integrate your business logic and your backend systems with your infrastructure. We'll give an example of this later in the talk. The service mesh that we're gonna focus on today is Console. Console is from uh, HashiCorp. Console's, uh, well, component architecture looks a bit like this. In the control plane, there are, there's usually a quorum of console servers uh, that, that uh, get together, uh, gossip, uh, and raft among each other. Uh, they, they do any number of, of functions, service discovery and things. They end up um, interacting with a console agent that's typically um, deployed one agent per node, kind of in a Kubernetes environment, sort of as a, a daemon set, if you will. The data plane um, ends up looking like this. Um, specific to console's architecture is the use of Envoy as its uh, as the, the data plane proxy that it's using. The architecture of console is also such that console will sidecar Envoy to your uh, application containers, will we'll insert Envoy as a sidecar proxy inside of your Kubernetes pods. As I was saying before, there are a number of other service meshes not all of them adhere to this style of, um, of data plane design, but um, we've seen um, this uh, style be popular as well as a, more of a, a one node, a one agent per node style. Because console has chosen uh, Envoy as its data plane proxy, uh, and because of some recent developments within Envoy, console is now able to take advantage of WebAssembly and run WASM modules as network filters. We'll talk more about this. And so WebAssembly. WebAssembly is an open standard 
It defines a binary format for executable programs. It's fast, portable, secure, kind of reminiscent of Docker in some respects. It, that standard defines interfaces for facilitating interaction with host environments that Wasm programs are running within. So the initial focus of these host environments was web browsers and large web applications and speeding them up. As an open standard, it's maintained by the W3C. Um, it has been adopted by all major browsers. And you know, as such, after HTML, CSS, JavaScript, it's the fourth language to run natively in web browsers. So it's exciting in general because of its performance characteristics. It's been uh, noted to have about 20% overhead. Um, if you're familiar with Java and the JVM, Wasm has a virtual stack machine uh, that's becoming something of a Wara, uh, write once, run anywhere. Again, we've kind of seen this before um, with Docker, that level of portability rather. So Wasm executables are pre-compiled. Um, there's a variety of languages that are supporting Wasm as a compilation target, um, about 40 in total. And so as Wasm and Envoy come together, um, the two of these are really the, the workhorses of the service mesh, both sitting in the data plane. Now, um, Google and Envoy maintainers have worked to bring Wasm to Envoy, and they've done this by embedding uh, the V8 JavaScript engine into Envoy, the V8 JavaScript engine that's used in Chrome. Now, through the WASI, or the WebAssembly system interface, Envoy exposes an application binary interface, an ABI, to Wasm modules so that they can operate as Envoy filters which is pretty exciting. Now, the way that uh, WASI works is relatively you know, straightforward. Um, you write your application in Rust, C, C++, you know, one of those languages. Um, then you, you build it and compile it into the WebAssembly binary um, targeting that particular WASI environment. Um, and then the binary that's generated requires a special runtime to execute um, that runtime, um, the, the, the virtual stack machine, you know, it then provides the interfaces necessary to make um, those system calls, those calls into that host environment. And so we talked earlier about how there are any number of service meshes. Um, those that run Envoy are um, bringing forth support for Wasm. And there are any number of others, maybe about 20 in total. There's a landscape that tracks these. It's uh, essentially a multi-mesh world. It's uh, a bit meshy out there, actually. Because of that, there are service mesh abstractions that have come forth, um, about three in total, and that are worth noting. The first of them is SMI, it's Service Mesh Interface. It's, um, I like to think of it as something of a horizontal API. Um, it's a standard interface for um, be, a standard interface behind which um, a service mesh can plug in, and um, it's part of its goal is to provide a, a, this uniform surface area for integrating with and interacting with service meshes. As such, it provides kind of lowest common denominator functionality across them. Uh, there's uh, another project called Hamlet. Um, it is for helping exchange service catalogs between service meshes, whether those are the same service mesh or two different types of service meshes. And so it's for service mesh federation. Um, lastly, there's the service mesh performance specification or SMPS. It's a format for describing and capturing the um, performance of a service mesh in context of its environment and in context of the functionality that it's performing, you know, in, in context of its configuration. Because of this, and because the, it is a multi-mesh world, um, and because some service meshes are more difficult to adopt than others, and really because 
the, the world needs a, a management plane. The open source project Meshery has been created as a multi-mesh manager um, and is SMI uh, compatible. It's also compatible with the service mesh performance specification. It's an implementation of that. As an open source project, it's been participating in Google Summer of Code through the CNCF. Uh, it's participating in the Community Bridge and Major League Hacking. So um, lots of people cutting their teeth for the first time um, in that project. This multi-mesh manager does a few things. It does lifecycle management of service meshes, but it also um, offers configuration best practices for uh, the operations of a, any given mesh. Um, it also does performance management. And like I was saying, it helps you understand the, the value versus the overhead of a mesh. So, so the, it does, uh, there is a cost associated with running a service mesh. There's a lot of value gleaned from running one. And whether or not you're doing it well um, is something to be managed ongoing. It's something to help you choose your, what, which mesh to deploy and then ongoing which mesh to, or whether or not you're, you're doing it well whether or not you're, you're getting enough value out of it. So the architecture of this particular um, management plane is, looks like this. So we've got a generic setup for a, a data plane and a control plane and some of their common components. Um, Meshery as a management plane um, lays down on top. It has a built-in load generators, WRK2, Ford IO. It has a set of uh, Docker, compo or Docker containers that run as a, either a Docker Compose application or a Kubernetes application, is able to interface with um, six different service meshes to date. And so we'll, we'll show it in action. Um, it is also capable of interfacing with and, um, well, with WebAssembly modules. To demonstrate that, we'll use a sample application called ImageHub. It's a lot like Docker Hub, except it's really simple and doesn't have much built into it. It's just two containers, um, the functionality of which is, is really small. Um, as an application, it allows users to sign up, uh, sign in, get a token, and choose what subscription plan they want. The purpose of this application is to help you understand that service meshes not only empower the operator, but also are very much so helpful to developers in terms of all of the functionality that they need to build into their apps, as well as to service owners or to product owners, and really being empowering of them in their control over application behavior. And we're gonna demonstrate that by way of subscription plans today, something that every SaaS offering has. So this application, very simple, a web-based front end written, uh, with using Vue.js and a, a back end written in Go. Um, we're gonna take that application and deploy it on console. And slightly in advance of where uh, console is today, we will uh, benefit from the fact that console uses Envoy as its data plane proxy. And we will um, insert in a Wasm module to function as an Envoy filter. And thanks to some advanced work that Nick Jackson of HashiCorp has done, we'll uh, demonstrate this to you now. We'll go ahead and head on into the demo. Okay, here we are in our demo environment. We are running Docker Desktop, which we're going to heavily leverage for running Kubernetes, as well as Docker Compose applications. We can see here that we don't have any um, workloads running other than just the default. Let's go ahead and get a Docker Compose app, Meshery, the service mesh management plane, up and running. So do a Meshery CTL system start. That will load up our device's default web browser and connect auto connect us to the Kubernetes environment. So to a Docker desktop in this case, which is great. Meshery manages um, currently six different service meshes and does a variety of actions on them. Um, the service mesh we're gonna use today is console. So Meshery is connected to its console adapter. We can go over to console and uh, go ahead and, and get it deployed as we do. Let's come back here and begin to watch um, what's going on on our system. And so what we'll want to do is get um, 
go ahead and, and deploy console. This console, though, is not... It is the latest version of console, but it's a little bit in advance of the latest release of console. Remember, this console has um, the Wasm runtime available to it so that we can begin to deploy our um, sample app, the image hub, both with that Wasm module that, that runs as an Envoy filter and without. And we'll just want to make sure that our um, console is fully up before we go ahead and, and deploy these uh, image hubs. The first one we'll deploy will be without the Wasm filter and it looks like it's up now. So we'll go ahead and get um, that deployed. We'll notice that as the image hub without the Wasm filter gets uh, deployed, it begins to receive Envoy sidecars. And we can go ahead and visit that application. Very simple app, a reminiscent of Docker Hub. You go to it and by default, you can't download any, can't make any pulls of Docker images. That's because you need to sign up and you need to sign up under a plan. Now they're a very, very simple app again, but the plans that it has are a personal, a team and an enterprise. The personal has 10 pulls per minute and the enterprise um, has an unlimited number of pulls. So let's get a user signed up, let's sign up Bob under the personal plan. So we'll sign him up get them logged in. And what we're gonna wanna do is, well, one, confirm that Bob can pull images. Great, he can, he can pull down images. Now let's go ahead and see if, uh, whether or not that personal plan that he signed up for is being um, imposed, and we'll use Meshery to generate a bunch of pull requests, or uh, pulls, rather. I think I've been using GitHub too much this week. Uh, and so we'll, generate a bunch of those requests against the pull API, maybe just for about five seconds here. Uh, I think I've seen about 500 or so requests get generated in that time. And um, what I need to do here is, I forgot to include our, the port that that app is running on. So we'll come back and run that test. Uh, because 100% of the requests failed because we had the wrong port. So we'll run it again and see that uh, there are no errors, that we were able to pull um, quite a few images down, pull, make quite a few requests. Now, what we'll want to do now is get the version of, so we'll go ahead and, and remove probably th that version of the image hub that doesn't have the filter. And at the same time, we'll go ahead and probably get up the version that does have the filter so that we can see really without code change, uh, uh, the service, the power of the service mesh for the product owner to be able to, uh, well, enforce a subscription plan and let people change subscription plans. So I think we've got the with the, with the filter version coming up and the without the filter going down. Great. Now that, that new version, or new instance rather with the filter is at this, on this port. Go ahead and go to this version. So again, and we're not able to make any pulls. Let's go ahead and sign up Bob again under the personal plan. And last time we saw that even though Bob was signed up under the personal plan, there was no filter rate limiting him. So now he's, he's signed up again, this time um, again under the personal plan, uh, but with the filter running. So let's go back to Meshery. Oh, let's go back to Meshery. Let's grab our new port number and run this performance test, this load test against the same pull interface. This time with the Wasm filter running, it's intercepting the um, you know, each of these packets as they go through, and it did let a few through. And that's because the personal plan is limited to 10 pulls per minute. So very good, there you have it. No code change, and the product owner benefits significantly from the power of the mesh. Hopefully this demonstrates to all of you that you can expect more from your infrastructure.
that uh, service meshes are empowering of developers, operators, well, and product managers. Wow. With that, we thank you for your time. Please join us in the service mesh community at slack.layer5.io.